Hi everybody, it's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. And my first question this week comes from Jesse Knobloch, who asks, Whenever a school shooting or anything of the sort happens, conservatives seem to jump on everyone saying it's anti-gun liberal propaganda. But to me, it seems like they're unfazed by these things, as if they want us to stop pointing out these events that make guns look bad. It might only be me, but I kind of think they want us to just accept that these things happen, stop reporting them, and just view these events as everyday life. It sounds like a stretch, really. What are your thoughts? I think you're right that the reaction of uh, the NRA and the gun lobby, the pro-gun culture in general, uh, is to try and divert attention from such events, or at least from the role of guns in such events. Uh, I remember very clearly the week after the uh, the Sandy Hook shooting when Wayne LaPierre made a big deal beforehand about how we're going to have a press conference and the NRA is going to lead this fight, you know, to prevent terrible tragedies like this from happening again. And for a brief moment, a brief naive moment, it looked like there had been an epiphany and the gun culture, the gun lobby was going to come around and say you know, okay, we all love guns, we all love the Second Amendment, but this has to stop. We have to commit to making some serious reforms. And then he came out and said, oh, it's all about mental health, and, <laughs> and, we, should, and we should put armed guards in schools. Um, and it's not that the mental health system in this country doesn't need a lot of reform and doesn't need a lot more help and a lot more attention. That, that's all completely true. But it, 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 was, it was an evasion tactic. It was a way of saying, oh, the guns. No, 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 it wasn't about the guns. What about this over here? What about this over here? And in fact, of actually suggesting that more guns in the hands of more people would have been the solution, not you know, restricting access to guns or being more discriminating about who we allow to own guns in this country. And those sorts of evasions and diversions almost always work. And I think the reason why they almost always work is because of our national gun fetish. I answered a question in last week's you had to ask about, about gun control from someone who described himself as, as a gun owner and a, a, a gun enthusiast, but not a gun nut. And I think that's a very good distinction to make. You can have uh, an appreciation for firearms as a collector, as, uh, as, as a shooter, as a hunter, or wh whatever. I don't personally get it myself, but I know people like that. I recognize people who, who have firearm collections, uh, who appreciate them in various ways that I don't really appreciate them. But they're not gun nuts. They, they don't equate gun ownership with the highest expression of their liberty. Um, and they, they recognize that maybe more, more responsible gun control more closer observation, registration, licensing, these sorts of things, background checks, uh, that these are necessary, and not just even necessary evils, that these are necessary good things that a responsible country should be doing. Um, and I think the, the reason why those people don't have the, the, the voice that we might wish they would have in this debate uh, is again because we have a we have a we have a gun fetish in the United States nationally culturally we have a gun fetish we have somehow convinced ourselves that gun ownership is the one necessary condition for our freedom and that to me is insane and sick and something that be we can pass all the laws we want we can pass stricter gun control we can we can have buybacks we can have tighter regulations gun license and we can start treating gun ownership like uh, car ownership I think that would be a, a great idea but even that even passing those laws and instituting those policy reforms would not be enough by itself we have to change the culture in this country we have to rid ourselves of our gun fetish and view firearms as something that maybe can be a positive thing that can be a good uh, 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 an instrument of safety an instrument of uh, of self-defense, something that we can collect and we can find value in, we can go hunting, we can whatever, but we but that we attach an obligation to use responsibly and to use with an eye toward the, the public, the community good, the common good. 
uh, and we stop viewing them as some sort of not just entitlement but some sort of obligation that if you care about freedom and you care about liberty you have to own a gun and you have to come out against any possible restriction of gun ownership that to me is absolutely insane and it's something that we have to rid ourselves of in this culture if we ever want to make significant progress on the gun control issue Terry James, what would you say is the difference between conspiracy theories and events like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment and NSA spying? Are the latter not conspiracies? They can certainly be described as conspiracies. I, I think your question illustrates very well uh, the way in which the term conspiracy theory is really a misnomer. What we usually describe as conspiracy theories, things like 9-11 you know, uh, was an inside job, or uh, the JFK assassination conspiracy theories, or the moon landing hoax, or things that, are, that we usually apply that term to, are not really theories. Uh, you're right, technically speaking, if we, wanna, if we wanted to apply the term conspiracy theory correctly, uh, then we would use it to describe uh, an, an evidence-based well-established explanation of how a real-life conspiracy was carried out. Uh, but that is not how we use the term. Conspiracy theories typically uh, are not theories. They are suspicions. They are innuendos. They're paranoid suggestions. Uh, a conspiracy theory is more like the rejection of a commonly accepted theory that explains something, a given event or phenomenon and the uh, insistence that there must be an alternative explanation. It's not that alternative explanation itself. It's, uh, it's the insistence that such an explanation must exist because the, the given explanation just doesn't work because of this and this and this and this and this. Um, and sometimes some conspiracy theorists go beyond that and will speculate as to what the real explanation is. But to me, the real heart of a conspiracy theory, and we might be more precise in calling it a paranoid conspiracy theory, which, which is, is how it is often described to sort of uh, identify it as what it is. Uh, the, the, the heart of such a thing is that rejection of the established explanation and the, the insistence, the insinuation maybe, that another explanation must exist and we just don't know what it is, or, or that explanation is being hidden from us. Uh, so it's not that there aren't real conspiracies. It's not that things like Tuskegee uh, are not, shouldn't be called conspiracies. It's not like the government never keeps things from us. It's not like these, these sorts of things have never happened. It's more that uh, the term conspiracy theory if you define it literally by its constituent terms, is a bit of a, a, a misleading term. Zombie pineapple. So a friend of mine has an evil cat. It stalks and attacks her, leaving scratches and bruises that she says are so painful that they make her cry. Naturally, she doesn't want to give up the cat. This doesn't seem to be because she likes the cat, but more out of a sense of guilt. She believes that she must have done something to make the cat hate her, and dropping it off at a shelter or giving it away seems to be out of the question. It's making her miserable. Now, there's lots of cat cultists about that believe cats are actually little humans and that they should be treated as one would treat a small child. My view is that they're dumb animals. They don't even pass the mirror test, for fuck's sake. While a person should not go out of their way to be mean to dumb animals, and it might even be nice to have a relationship with one, suffering literal wounds every day out of a refusal to recognize that a cat is not a person is just taking it too far. So the question is, what can be done about an evil, violent cat? And if nothing can be done, is it okay to just drop the horrible thing off at a shelter? I'm very, very reluctant to recommend that anybody give up their pet or pawn their pet off to someone else. To me, it's not a matter of guilt, it's a matter of responsibility. If you have a pet, if you have a cat or a dog or whatever, it, that you have a responsibility. You're in charge of taking care of that animal. That animal depends on you for its survival and, and, and so that's your job. And if you give up that job or you pass that responsibility on to someone else, 
you had better A, have a really good reason for doing it, and B, make sure that the person you're handing that responsibility to will be will be able to honor that responsibility. So it, to me, it's a big deal. And I, I, I would never lightly suggest that someone just give up a problematic pet, a difficult pet. Um, and I, I'm not sure that I believe in evil cats or cats that uh, that can't be helped. I'm not a cat expert. I'm not an, anim an animal psychologist or behavioral specialist. I, I, I have no expertise in this area at all. But if the cat is attacking her, it sounds like maybe the cat just has some energy or some instinctual things to work out that, that maybe it could be provided in a more productive way, maybe getting a cat toy, maybe getting the cat some other way of exercising so that the cat doesn't feel the need to attack her and hurt her. I agree. Like the, the, you can't have a cat that's just going to keep hurting you. That's off the table. I completely agree. She shouldn't just be expected to put up with that for the rest of her life or for the rest of the cat's life. But I think there must be some way to siphon that energy off in, a, in a, a more acceptable way. I don't know what that way would be. I don't know if going to talk to a veterinarian or talking to a pet trainer or a pet specialist would be the way to go. But I would certainly only give up on the cat as an absolute last resort. Uh, I would never recommend just, oh, just fuck that cat, you know, just throw it, just give it to a shelter. Um, I think it's a matter of responsibility. I don't think it can be solved just by being sweet and nice to the cat. I think clearly that's not going to do it because you're right. A cat is not a person. A cat is not a child. A cat is an animal. A cat has particular needs, uh, uh, particular things that an owner for a cat has to do that are different from caring for a child or caring for a human or even caring for another type of animal. Uh, and there might be some adjustments that can be made in those areas that would alter the cat's behavior in a positive way. I would look into that. I would certainly not say just, you know, drop the cat off at a shelter. It's, it's a responsibility to me. David Landon. Steve, I found that there are movies from almost any era that are layered and have complex characters. However, I don't think that is true of TV shows. From what I've seen, TV shows from the 50s to the 80s were very one-dimensional. Characters rarely developed over time, and there were few complex characters that had both good and bad characteristics, and the shows pretty much always ended the same way they began. I find that TV shows have become much more interesting and complex over the decades, both in terms of long story arcs and character development. A good example is Dexter, where you find yourself rooting for and still horrified by a sociopath. Your thoughts? I agree with you that uh, sort of saga storytelling and long-term character development like you describe is a relatively recent innovation uh, in television. I think the medium has certainly evolved and grown more complex over over the decades. Uh, it certainly is much different now than it was back in the day. But I, I would not be so quick to dismiss uh, TV from the golden age of television from the 50s as one-dimensional. I mean, certainly a lot of it was. You're absolutely right. A lot of it was very simplistic and one-dimensional. But uh, if you look at some of the anthology shows from the 50s, the shows that uh, that the Twilight Zone was like a product of or, or an evolution of, uh, shows like Studio One, like Playhouse 90, I think you'll find some really, really good stuff there. Uh, we A lot of those old episodes are still around. We still have them today. They've been released on DVD, or you can find them on the Internet. Uh, they're recordings originally made from kinescopes because a lot of those shows were broadcast live on television. They were not edited, filmed things. It was basically like a, a live videotaped play. Uh, and so it's interesting for that as well. You're watching like a live presentation from 60 years ago now. Um, but some of those shows are really excellent, and the, the thing that appeals to me about them and the thing that has made them so influential to me as a writer, as a critic, that has really allowed them to shape my taste in a very, very strong way is that uh, the story was king. You know, the, the story was the draw, was the reason to watch the show. You tuned into the show because you wanted to see a good story. The casts were generally unknowns. 
The production values were generally not very high. As I said, they were broadcast live on video. They were done on sound stages. Um, it was the story that brought you to that channel, that made you sit down in your living room and watch that show. And the stories were written by some of the greatest writers in the history of television. The, the 1950s, the golden age of TV, was prior to the current era, uh, really the, the, the realm of great television writers. That's where Rod Serling came from. Before Rod Serling created The Twilight Zone, he was writing for Studio One and Playhouse 90. He was writing things like Requiem for a Heavyweight and Patterns. Uh, Reginald Rose, one of my favorite writers ever, who wrote Twelve Angry Men. Twelve Angry Men was originally an episode of Studio One before it was a film. Uh, Patty Chayefsky, um, who wrote Network, was uh, originally got his start writing TV, writing dra live dramas for Studio One, for Playhouse 90. The, one, he was one of the great giants of early TV. Uh, so there's some really good stuff there if you watch. There's some really great shows, like the ones I mentioned, like The Defenders, if you can find that. Uh, even some of the, the early episodes of Dragnet, even though I, a lot of times Dragnet falls into that, what you describe as like a very one-dimensional show where there's not a lot of character development. Some of those Dragnet episodes are pretty good. Uh, so it, it's just as today, it's a matter of picking out the good from the bad, finding the stuff that's really special and worthwhile, and discarding uh, the junk. But uh, if you're looking for serious, well-written, well-crafted uh, drama, you can find it in the early golden age of television. There's some excellent stuff there. Matt Lesnar, do you believe in objective morality? No, but I would qualify that answer by saying it, it depends on uh, what scale you are asking that question at. I don't believe that ultimately there is a thing uh, that we could call objective morality. I think morality is ultimately man-made, and I think it's subjective to us as people, as moral beings. But I could say it's objective uh, from the scale of an individual. I do think that, like, from my perspective as one person, uh, it's objective. I don't think I invent my own morality just purely on my own. I, f I feel like I have a role in determining morality. I, I, I take part in a conversation, uh, in a dialectic, that determines moral principles and moral values. Uh, but I, as an individual, I don't, I don't feel like I decide for myself what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, what I ought to do and what I oughtn't to do. Uh, I, I, I judge what values I choose to follow. I judge what values I accept, what, what, what seems just to me, what seems fair to me. Uh, but I don't feel like I'm inventing morality. So I would say it's subjective from my perspective. It's subjective from the perspective of an individual. But ultimately, I'd say it's subjective. And even if you believe in God and you believe that God is the source of morality, I would say that you have to, you have to ultimately come to a point where it is subjective. Because if, uh, if, if God determines morality, then it might be objective to moral beings who are obligated by that morality, who are sort of under that umbrella, but it's subjective relative to God. And if God is the ultimate authority, then morality is ultimately subjective. I just don't see how you get around having subjective morality unless you just posit that, mor that moral principles simply exist similar to the way laws of physics exist. They're, they're just there. And they're not determined by any individual. They're not determined by any person's behavior or will or desires or opinion or judgment or whatever. They're just there. Uh, that's the only way I can see getting to truly objective moral principles. But most people who argue for God being the source of morality don't make that argument. Uh, so I think ultimately it's, it's, it's always going to be subjective. Emigdio's back. Steve, how often does lightning strike in Hagerstown? I don't know about Hagerstown, but in Sharpsburg, it strikes about once a week, and always around this time. Which means that it's time for... The Lightning Round. Rapid fire questions. Glib and adequate answers. Piker eyes. Are there any other sports besides baseball and pro wrestling? Yes, it is a sport, all you haters! 
that you follow? Do you have a fantasy baseball league? And what are your views on fantasy leagues? Are they just a waste of time? I always like the quote that sports fantasy leagues are just Dungeons and Dragons games for jocks. Um, I don't really follow any other sports besides baseball and wrestling, if you want to call wrestling a sport. I kind of was sort of into tennis when I was a teenager, and I, I sometimes cock an eye in that direction, but not really. And I, yeah, that's how I feel about fantasy sports leagues. I'm not in any. I've never really participated in it. I find them to be boring and silly for the exact same reasons that I find Dungeons and Dragons to be boring and silly. Amazing Bull Weevil, do you ever debate theists, Steve? I'd love to see you in conversation with a believer. My question is, what strategy do you think Bill Nye should use when he goes up against Ken Ham in their upcoming debate? Um, I've debated theists before. I, uh, I've, I debated Side 10 Bruggen Kate on the Bible Thumping Wingnut show. I debated Shock of God on his website uh, a while ago. I mean, those sorts of things are fun. I enjoy it. I would rather have conversations with theists than uh, debates. That's just me. Um, I think Bill Nye should just hold uh, Ken Ham's feet to the fire. He has a great scientific expertise. He knows what he's talking about. He has uh, hundreds of years of scientific knowledge at his back. He should just point out the fallacies, point out the incorrect statements that Ken Ham makes, and just go with that. It's not going to make that much of a difference to Ken. He's not going to. He's not going to convince Ken Ham that uh, evolution is. Is, is a fact, but he can hold up his end. He can, he can uh, represent his point of view in an honorable and effective way. And that's, that's what I'm hoping he'll do. Gazder, do you believe the Dark Knight movies are politically neocon? I don't personally. I think that is a misinterpretation of those films. I think you, I, I see where people get it from, but uh, the main point to me is I think the movie disapproves of Batman's actions, particularly in the Dark Knight. They always say the Dark Knight is like the neocon one because of the surveillance, and it's like, you know, Batman, it proves that you have, sometimes you have to do bad things to do good. Uh, th the point they miss is I don't think the movie approves of Batman doing it. I, I think the movie is actually on the side of Lucius. I think Lucius is speaking for the film. Uh, and speaking for the moral of the film rather than Batman. I think the film is saying, look, Batman is the hero, but Batman is doing something wrong. He shouldn't be doing this. It's his desperation that has pushed him to this point. It's not justifying and celebrating Batman's behavior. Bill F. 1967. Who's your favorite Oriole player ever, other than Cal Ripken? Eddie Murray, and that includes Cal Ripken. Eddie Murray is my favorite Oriole, my favorite baseball player ever of anybody. I love Cal. But I love Eddie more. Finder Finder 100. What large animal would you like to see in a puppy-sized version? Oh, man. Wouldn't it be great if tigers just stayed, like, kitten size? Wouldn't it be awesome to have, like, a, 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 a tiger kitten that just never grew up into an unstoppable killing machine that you could just keep in your house and have as a pet? That would be sweet. Uh, uh, Jason Brene. Steve, do you have any sexy plans for You Had to Ask, number 69? No, but, I mean, now I kind of feel pressured to come up with something. I don't know. I, I guess I'll have to work on that. Thanks, Jason. Eric Chu, Steve, what makes you become an atheist? Um, because I, I care about what is actually true. I want the things I believe in, the things I think are true, to actually be true. And uh, I, I see no reason to believe that God exists. If I, if I believe that God exists, I just don't think that's true. There's no reason for me to believe that. There's no evidence compelling me to have that belief. So that's why I'm an atheist. Uh, Zen humanist, where are your ancestors from? Well, ultimately, I think they're from the same place that yours are from. But more recently, I think my, my, my European ancestry is Scottish, as far as I've been able to discover. I haven't put a lot of work into it, but from what I can tell, uh, my, my European ancestors were Scottish. I think Shives is a, a Scottish-derived name. Nuno Uno 001, what does God need with a starship? Um... Well, he needs a starship because he forgot the transwarp beaming equation that Scotty invented in the first J.G. Abrams Star Trek movie. He had that, but then he lost it, so now he needs starships to keep going back and forth from planet to planet. So that's, that's what God needs with a starship. Plus, he's just lazy. 
You know, the omnipotence, is, it's omnipotence, yes, but it's not omni-motivation. He's just lazy. He'd rather just, you know, sit on his fat ass and just get a ride from place to place. That's, that's, that's what you got when you got God. That's what you're dealing with. Hey, that's it for the lightning round. Um, before I get out of here, I want to do a shout out. The shout out this week goes to a very deserving YouTube channel. Not that they all aren't, but this one is a very deserving channel. It goes to Logic. Logic is an awesome YouTube channel. He's got about 12,000 subs, which is awesome. It's great to see him uh, getting an audience. There's nothing, no shame in 12,000 subs, nothing to sneeze at at all. Very impressive. But let's see if we can get him a few more because he deserves it. Logic uh, has some excellent videos on creationism, countering creationism. And two series in particular that I want to point out are uh, series that he's done in response to uh, John Morris Pendleton, who is a creationist scientist, I guess you would say. Uh, technically, I guess he is a scientist. Uh, uh, and the, the series uh, on Logic's channel is called uh, Hello, I Am a Scientist. And then also one of my favorite creationist personalities, uh, Carl Ball. He's done videos in response to Carl Ball's uh, TBN series, uh, Creation in the 21st Century. And Logic's version is uh, Science in the 12th Century. It's a really, really excellent response to creationism and to those two guys in particular. And as a guy who used to watch Carl Ball's show on TBN, uh, religiously, if you'll pardon the pun, uh, and, and just laugh my ass off at how horrible it was. Those videos that Logic does uh, to argue against Carl Ball are just phenomenal. So if you are not a subscriber of Logic, check out that channel and let's see if we can up, uh, bump up that sub count a little bit because he deserves it. It's a terrific channel. Well, that's it for this week. I will be back again next week to do this all over again. Uh, Unfortunately for, for Jason, I don't know. I don't think I have anything terribly sexy planned for number 69. I, I, he'll, you'll just have to deal, buddy. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, I will be back to do this same thing next week, uh, provided, of course, that you ask me some questions. Because for me to do this, you have to ask. So please leave a comment on this video. Ask me anything about anything. Nothing is too silly. Nothing is too serious. I always get way more questions than I can possibly fit into a single video, and that is awesome. Please continue to make that happen. Ask me anything about anything, and I will do my best to answer as many of them as I can in the next video. So until next time, take care, everybody. Thanks for watching.